Hello and welcome. You're watching Anderson Community Television, and I'm your host, Kyle Densler, for your November edition of Anderson Speaks. With us, we have a very special guest here celebrating uh, a pretty monumental anniversary. To my right, your left, is Father Joe Brigotti with the Camboni Missionaries. Right. Father nice Joe. to see you. I'm Thank you for coming on the show, sir. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So there are a lot of people in this area. Even I, I, I grew up in the Amelia area. I, I knew uh, what was there and, and the, the things that went on. But a lot of people in this area are very familiar with uh, the Camboni Mission and the missionaries, or they at least are, are aware of it. Right. Um, we would love to get your history, uh, uh, where you're originally from, what brought you over here, and then uh, even further back, the history of the mission and, and what makes uh, this year specifically so special. Okay, wherever you want to start from. <laughs> you're the boss. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Um, probably we should start with our presence here in Anderson Township. Uh, we are celebrating our 75, 75th anniversary of our presence in the United States. Mm. And our presence in the United States started around Thanksgiving in 1939 in Cincinnati. Wow. The Archbishop called us to take care of um, Afro-American parishes in the West End. And then when we wanted to open a seminary, he pointed us in the direction of what used to be called Forestville, <laughs> which is now part of Anderson Township, and we bought a property at the corner of Nagel and uh, Beachmont. And there, uh, there was a pre-existing house, but then eventually we built our seminary, Sacred Heart Seminary. Mm. And um, it has been our headquarters ever since. So this is basically when we come back from the missions, when we come to back to the States, this is like coming home. So it's the United States or North American headquarters? Yes, correct. And uh, um, of course, uh, when we uh, bought the property in the early 40s, it was nothing like uh, you know today. For one thing, there was no Anderson Township. Mm -hmm. It was called, in, we were in Forestville. We were not called Comboni Missionaries. We were called Verona Fathers because our founder was from Verona, Italy. Mm. Um, and then the names were changed on us, so now we live in Anderson Township. We are called Comboni Missionaries, but we are still the same people living in the same place. Hmm. Um, we are called Comboni because of our, um, the name of our founder, St. Daniel Comboni, who was the first bishop of Central Africa. Hmm. He uh, resided in Khartoum and was now the capital of the Sudan. And uh, he fought the slavery, and he traveled widely across Europe, too, and he met many of the great explorers who went to Africa eventually and wrote books about it as they uncovered a number of things in Africa. And uh, in '39, as I say, we ended up um, here in Cincinnati and eventually in what is now Anderson Township. Um, of course, Anderson Township, um, as it was then, um, we had about 65 acres of land. Wow. There were hardly any houses around us, a few on Nagel. There was a pharmacy. There was no parish, no Catholic church. They started saying mass in a, in a private house, hmm. roughly where the parish is now. But there used to be a drive-in movie. <laughs> and one of the very first um, fast food places. But for everything else, we had to go to Mount Washington. Anderson School was on Beachmont, uh, where Kroger was, and then Kroger went across the street. And, um, and then the mall was just a piece of wasteland that sat there for many years, and I guess there were some fights over it. Eventually, wow. they built the mall. Occasionally, since many of us were from Italy at the time, um, we would play soccer in what was the football field, and cars would stop wondering what were these people doing, kicking around their own ball all over this field. <laughs> so things have changed. So yeah. are, you, are, you, are you trying to get me to believe that soccer wasn't known? Or people didn't well known even know much? what it was. Really? It was one of those things that Italians and, and Spaniards did, yes. It's crazy Europeans. Yes, yeah, all those <laughs> Europeans, you know. yes. But anyway, here we are. But you guys didn't come over to spread the good news of soccer. No, we came. You guys came over at, at the direction at the direction of our, of our superiors in Rome, who after, uh, at the, um, as World War II was coming close, and people could see it coming, 
we had many missions in uh, British um, Africa. So we wanted more people who could go to the mission, uh, English speaking people. So we went to England, we went to, we came to the States, hoping to find um, young people who would join us and eventually go to those missions. At the same time, we offered our services to the, to the church here. So that was our, um, our purpose, a dual purpose of serving the community here and of serving our missions abroad, which wow. is our main focus. So uh, offering the opportunities for folks here to, to go out yes. and serve, but also be Correct. a blessing. Here. Yes. And locally, um, well, during, in the course of time, of course, the seminary, we had Sacred Heart Seminary was closed, but the nativity scene that many people remember uh, is still uh, working. Hmm. We start, our students started it in 1947, and it's still going. That's older than my dad. Well, yes, That's people, people <laughs> used to stand in line outside in the cold and to enter into this carriage house, they called it, where we had built a nativity scene with a sort of a light and sound type of thing, which is still what it is today. There are moving things and, and the whole story of Christmas. Now we have grandparents who used to come on a school bus when they were children wow. Uh, wow. to see it. And we have much more now. We have a museum, we have a mission market, we have several things to show besides that. Also, uh, for a number of years, uh, younger folks will remember that for a number of years we um, hosted the um, Immaculate Heart of Mary Parish. Uh, the, the, the youth group had um, uh, a haunted house, mm -hmm. and they drew great crowds. And it was very difficult to even enter the property. I remember having to come back some evenings and I had to explain to the police why I was allowed to park near the house. I mean, I lived there uh. you know, because there were just hundreds of kids coming to see it. Be, being younger and living out in the Amelia area, that's the name, Comboni, that's what I knew about it. Like, uh -huh. I, 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 knew, I knew a little more, but, but that's when everyone talk, talked yes. about it. That was the experience. And I remember going and... I remember uh, it being a, a good time, and it was the oh, first time I'd ever been chased by someone with a chainsaw. Uh -huh. Yes, well, and I used to sleep right there. So oh, was. and <laughs> well, anyway, that's that's uh, that's an aside. But um, our presence here also, we help out in the local parishes, and now that we have sold most of our property, what we have left is of great service to the community, starting with the grounds. We always have people walking, either their kids or their dogs. And then um, we have a Montessori school that has been renting from us for the past 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, half the building is available for groups that want to come in for uh, weekends or retreats or whatever. Uh, right now we have for a week a, a group, uh, an interfaith group that deals with homeless people and we have homeless families that are staying there a week and during the day they look for work or for whatever. Um, so we are, um, we are open to, um, to the community in any possible way. This is locally. And within the uh, greater Cincinnati area, uh, at the moment, uh, one of our men is in charge of the Hispanic uh, ministry for the Catholic Church in, uh, in the Diocese of Cincinnati. So that means about 70,000 people. Wow. So some of us help him with uh, Spanish services and all that. Um, this is locally. However, uh, even though the center is smaller, there are only five of us living there. And we belong to five different countries of birth. Wow. Uh, <laughs> um, we have, um, as uh, priests, brothers, sisters, lay people, we are about... 3,500, 4,000 people around the world in four different continents, 40 countries. And our office is like a nerve center because from here, with the modern means of communication, we can be in touch with any one of these places at the grassroots. I have been uh, working with the, uh, mostly in the field of the uh, communications, in the press mostly. Mm -hmm. And I remember the uh, bureau chief of a great, um, of one of the main uh, international wires telling me that he envied us because he had one reporter in East Africa. We had 450 missionaries at the grassroots wow. who could just send us news on what was happening really on the ground. 
Wow. Sometime watching international news and dealing with places where we work, we wonder whether people really know what they're talking about because they haven't been there, they don't know, they don't know the people. So this we can do from this little place in Beachmont. Wow. So much there, so much uh, activity and history and significance. And it's something I think a lot of people, they know it's there, but they don't realize everything that's there. No, they remember it's us for the haunted house. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so out of the original, what, 65 acres? About Yes, how, how? we probably have about 10, I think. We have a post office on the grounds now. At, uh, well, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. We could actually live there without going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, no one of you guys, that you have the market cornered on communication. Have you yeah. got the post office there, too? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have the corner of the so um, <clears throat> tell me more about the, uh, uh, the founder, the person who's, who kind of birthed this vision. Yes. Uh, uh, Daniel Comboni was, um, was born in uh, northern Italy. At that time, it was part of the um, Austrian Empire in um, 1831. And he went to school in Verona, and he was um, raised in a group that had some interest, early interest in the missions in Africa. Those were the beginning of the colonial powers. And so he ended up with this great desire to go to Africa. And he went when he was in his late 20s as a priest and with some of the others. He went back and forth several times. And um, most of the others died very young because of fevers. Uh, mm. They didn't know the environment. Eventually, he came up with a plan uh, that to regenerate Africa, it had to be done by Africans. So um, he, he was freeing slaves, he was educating people, so that in his own lifetime he had African teachers, an African, uh, an African priest, African nurses from former slaves who had been uh, freed and educated. And um, uh, of course there were people who didn't see that uh, very benignly. <laughs> Okay. You know, the world being what it is. But it was the great discovery because it says eventually you have to be part of the culture to really um, ra raise it up and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and improve or uh, adapt or whatever uh, without um, injuring it, mm -hmm. without going to say, well, this is uh, quote unquote civilization. Um, really, uh, it's a very ambiguous term. And this is how we do it. So yeah, because we do it, so we are civilized, you. and you have to do it the same way. That mistake has been done, mm -hmm. but and, and now it takes us generations to um, to bring it back to what it should be. That is, you enter into a culture and you see the presence of God there, and you bring it out. Mm. So that uh, a, 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 an African anthropologist who wrote several books, said that Christianity has given um, Africa the great gift of, the f of hope, the great gift of the future. Wow. That wasn't really part of the, of the tradition, but it, it opens us to eternity, not to the past, but to the future, building on the past. So we have, our job is to put all of that together according to our religious Catholic universal view. I love the way that you said it. You said we go in and we we help bring out the truth that's there. We help bring out the God that's there. We, it's not that we come in and we bring this. We help. No, God was always out. there. Always I didn't there. go down on my plane. I work in Africa. <laughs> I worked in Uganda for 10 years at two different times. And um, when I first went, I was going to set the world on fire. Then I realized that nobody wants to be set on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, but you know that together we would discover the richness from the richness of their culture and that we had the fact that for them they always believed in God but God was far away and Christianity brings it close to us brings it in us so that was the big mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, discovery later on when I came back um, some years were peaceful some weren't but anyway it was a wonderful experience then I, I worked in Rome for five years to um, start a, 
a news agency from our mission places. I was feeding news to the wires. Wow. And just because sometimes they don't know which way to turn. So mm -hmm. I would call one of the wires and say, do you know about what's happening in the Sudan? Yeah, my correspondent told me this and that. I said, well, let me tell you what's going on. I got it this morning. And, and so um, that's what I did for five years. And then when I, I was mostly in this type of offices, even here in town with our magazine and our publications. And when I got to be 70, I decided I needed a, a birthday gift. And so my gift to myself was to get away from the offices. And I asked to go to Guatemala. And I spent three and a half years with the Mayan people in northern Guatemala. And that wow. was great. Wow. It was great. It was a wonderful experience. And we also... Um, helped me to know, uh, in part, what's going on now with migration of people and so forth, because I've seen it from both sides. Wow. So, and most of us have similar experiences. The five of us who live here have had similar experiences. We, we only have a few minutes left, and I don't want to get into something that, that's more that we can chew in that time, but we hear a lot of talk in, in culture, in news, in politics about diversity and, and celebrating that and embracing that. From your experience, I, I feel like you've, you've been exposed to a lot of different things and yes. grown an appreciation for that. How do you view your experience against the way we kind of talk about it here? Does it seem to line up with what you've seen or is there something we can do to well, do a better job Well, the main problem it? I see coming back to the Midwest is that people divide the world into two areas. There's the over here and the over there. Yeah. Those people down there, usually, they're usually down there. Yeah. And our job is to try to um, part of the bridge, since we have all of this information from the outside and also the history from the outside, to bring it in so has to um, bring us up to par. We are very, uh, I would say, very provincial in our view of the world. Well, sometimes even our view of the states, if you ask, even students, where is was the capital of such and such a state, and where is it on the map? They can't find it. Half the people I bet can't find Iraq down to these days. <laughs> so um, I, I found that to be a very um, a great deficiency, and to think that <clears throat> now that there are people coming from different cultures, that we are the culture, that we have all the answers. Mm. Uh, Sometimes people are so um, indifferent to the world that they don't even have the questions, let alone the answers. Wow. And so for me, this is our mission when we come back um, to be missionaries here by bringing the message of the rest of the world and mostly the underprivileged and the poor, which are the majority, to us here. Wow. To make us understand that we are not an island, but that, you know, we are part of a of a family. Mm -hmm. yeah. Perspective. Yes. Perspective. So uh, we touched on this earlier. Um, if you could just close us, close us off in the next couple of minutes. Uh, what is the significance of the 75th anniversary for you? But for us, um, we look at the past, we look at some of the people who have been an influence here. Like I know some people, for instance, will remember Father Mario Ongaro, who was uh, very much present in this community in Anderson Township. He was known um, as a counselor and as a confessor, and he died a couple of years ago. Father Accorsi, the older folks will remember that. And people who left a uh, mark with their presence because of their, 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 their mission, missionary heart. And at the same time, and not to let it die there, but to uh, pick it up and move it on to celebrate the 100th anniversary with new blood, with also with new forms of ministry, depending mm -hmm. on, on the needs. You can't be said, said because we did it this way uh, 100 years ago, we have to do it this way now. Uh, we have to see what does the future bring. So. We look forward to the next 25 years. Sounds like you're not, uh, you're not scared of that word change. No, as a matter <laughs> of fact, uh, the only, um, uh, you know, the only quiet place where nobody complains and uh, nothing ever changes is a cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Wherever there is life, there is change. And if you don't understand that, then you don't understand life. You do not understand Christianity. Uh, it's a big gap. That's awesome. There has to be change. Yes. That's awesome. Father Joe, thank you so much for coming on. My pleasure. We, uh, we celebrate with you the 75th anniversary of Comboni Mission and the missionaries. 
uh, the North American province. Again, thank you for sharing for 75 years of, of service through the, through the missionaries and for your uh, personal service and uh, to 25 more years and beyond. Thank you. We'll right. see what happens. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll be right back with our next guests. Welcome back to Anderson Speaks. It is my pleasure to introduce a really great group that I'm excited to speak with. Uh, with us now we have members and representatives from All Nations Drum, and I'm gonna allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, to my right is... Tomiha uh, Seya Yellowflower. Introduce yourself. I'm better known as Tyler, but my real name is Swift Buckskin Horse. Swift Buckskin Horse. Yeah. Thank you. I'm John Spotted Horse Helton. I'm Joy Singing Dove Nelson. And I'm Sheila Three Feathers Kendall. Thank you all for coming on. Mm, I'm really excited to us. chat with you and I appreciate you guys coming on to share. Um, John, could you uh, tell us All Nations Drum? This is uh, a group that you guys are, are in together. What it is that you guys, wh what is it that you guys uh, do? Uh, we're a drum group and we uh, do the song and dance. We uh, do a lot of the Appalachian Fest, the Patriot, a lot of the events around Cincinnati here, and, and then uh, some in Columbus, and we go into Kentucky and West Virginia a little bit. Cool. Now, folks at home are probably starting to pick up on some, some cues. What is it that also binds you guys together? We're all Native American. You're all Native American. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something that uh, we were talking before the show. Um, you guys all embrace this identity. Um, there are varying, I guess, degrees of uh, hereditary uh, influence or mix, but you guys embrace that. So there's varying ex experiences between all of you, yes. but but you guys get to enjoy the the uh, the All Nations Drum experiences together. Um, why don't you go ahead and start with yourself? Tell us about your history. Uh, I heard some things about. Uh, Living in different places? Yes. Uh -huh. um, I am Chinook, and I'm from Washington State, Yakima Reservation. Um, I actually travel around, and I am a storyteller for my people. Um, and I, I travel around, and I tell stories. But not only do I tell stories, I learn stories, which is very, very important. As a storyteller, we tell our heritage. We tell our beliefs. We talk of our culture. But a storyteller also is a way to talk to our people, to to give them courage and to give them strength and, and, and to increase their pride. So a storyteller learns the stories of her people and her culture, and it could be male or female. And uh, we carry on our tradition. We carry on our stories. We pass from generation to generation the Native American people. We keep ourselves alive through our stories. Very cool. Very cool. Now, are you the only member that's lived on a reservation, or do we have another No, one? actually, I believe Tyler has as well. Mm -hmm. Tyler, where do you uh, hail from? A little town in Canada called Port Alberni, British Columbia. And uh, how long have you been? Do you live in this area currently? Uh huh. How long have you been here? About ten years. Okay. What facilitated that move? My wife made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> Because that's all he has to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> so can either of you speak to uh, your experiences living on a reservation? I, in, in America, it's, um, I don't want to say complicated. It's a, it's, I think it's an odd thing for some folks because they're like, well, it's, it's in our country, but it's sovereign. I don't think they understand that all the time about how, I don't know, if it's, it's different, different places, but what it's like and, and how it's different? Well, I, I think from my aspect and from what I've learned is, is that you have the Native American people living on the reservation and then you have the outside. So it's a struggle with our young people as well as our tribe and our nation because we want to live our culture. We want to maintain ourselves. But at the same time, we have to assimilate and we have to live outside in the world. 
and it's, it's, it's really hard not to lose that part of you or lose your culture. Um, reservations, um, quite a few in the United States are, are pretty sad. They really are. There's a lot of poverty. Alcoholism is there. Um, suicide is probably one of the highest rates, I think, on reservations wow. right now for the Native American people because there's such a unevenness. There's the, the strive of our young people to want to get out there and to live their lives, but at the same time they have the pull of their culture and the pull of their elders to, to remember and to be who they are. And um, so it's a fine line. They have to learn, and sometimes it doesn't happen, and, and they, um, you get that poverty and you, you get that um, um, alcoholism. And, uh, but we have a lot of strong Native Americans here in the United States who are stepping up for our people, who are stepping past that barrier but maintaining who they are, and they're teaching and they're out there speaking for us. Tyler, can you share with that some? I would say that amongst our people, before civilization got here, we're a very spiritual people. We did things together, we laughed, we cried, we played, we sang songs. If I went to another country, I'd probably see a lot of the same things, but their instruments would be different. We use a drum. And amongst our people, the skin of that drum is highly respected. Amongst our people making a sound like that to keep a rhythm. When uh, I came across this group, I thought it was pretty good that they had good rhythm. And then their voices all in sync like that. It was easy to follow. I was never asked to join the drum. I just showed up every time. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I was an elder. <laughs> We just adopted him, he just didn't know it. <laughs> Very cool. But I guess now I'm part of the group. <laughs> if it's not official yet, it should be. Yeah, it's official. I have quite a few different groups that I am an elder in. And uh, I would say six different groups from the West Coast to here. And one of the more important ones to me is those ones that practice spirituality. One with the earth, mm. one with all people. If somebody would ask me what would make a traditional Native American, I would have to be honest and say, bottle of whiskey. Yeah. Huh. Still today, the young youth of our people start early. And sometimes, with the continuous power of prayer amongst the elders, I would draw someone into our path. Pretty soon we hear them drumming, singing, praying. You were asking earlier what kept this group together. I think it's the prayers of the people. We'll become traditional in the old way. It it involves a lot of prayer. We hit that drum, sing songs. Some of them sound like war songs and party songs. And, but to us, all of it is prayer. When you go inside that circle and dance, some people don't realize it. But once they get in there, they're 
standing on holy ground. Mm -hmm. They keep coming back, they will eventually feel it. They felt good when they went in, and when they left, they didn't feel that great. So they keep coming back, because we, amongst the traditional spiritual people, are still praying for our people to come together. Yes. What really got me when opening of every time I went to a powwow to drum. Our drum leader would lay his left hand on the drum and pray to Great Spirit that it would be a good one. Well, not too long ago, well, I guess you could call it long. Depends on how you look at time. Well, 42 years ago, I came into this path of spirituality, mainly because I wanted to learn how to talk to the Great Spirit. I had nothing to go on except my drunken parents. Mm. My grandma and grandpa were sober, spiritual, praying people. And when they left this world, they were probably glad mm. at least one of us has become a real living human being. And when, when he closed down the drum for duration of powwow, again he would put his left hand on the drum and thank the spirits for coming in to help us. I noticed that there are still a lot of people that come to powwows to dance around in that circle. And one of my prayers is they would realize they're, they're on sacred ground, yes. on holy ground. And that's pretty much the glue that holds us all together. The, the struggles that you guys have seen, do you attribute it to a, a loss of that understanding or uh, an over influence of the world around? Because one parallel I'm trying to draw for, for, to help people understand might be, I know in Ohio we have a lot of Amish folk. And it's either like, you live this way completely, or you don't. Is, is there an aspect similar to that, that especially the young folk have to deal with? Is it an all or nothing, or is there, is there a way to find balance? We, we what you call, um, a lot of the people that follow the Red Road, you sometimes, a lot of times, you live in two worlds. You have the get up and go to work, take care of the family, make sure that all the things that are done that needs to be done in, in what we call society is now. And then we have to go and also protect our heritage and uh, teach these things to our, to our young'uns and our, our children so that when they get older they still carry that on. So we, we would be what you call live in two different worlds a lot of times. You know, you have to do certain things sometimes, but we never forget who we are. We always carry our tobacco for our prayers. We, uh, you know, we always keep those things that are sacred to us, whatever those might be to us. But uh, truly, we do. We live in two worlds. And I think part of your question, too, was the influence on our children. Um, 
I think in the past our children were lost, but there's a great drive now for the Native American people to be recognized as a people. Um, they're beginning to stand up and they're beginning to say, we will teach our children, we want our culture back. Um, quickly, what happened to the Native American people has happened to every culture in the world. There has been some kind of genocide or some group has conquered another group. But with the Native American people, we were put in places that we didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of our tribes were moved, if they were Plains Indian, they could have been moved to the desert. Um, they, were, they were taken from their land that they knew and their traditions and their cultures, and they were put someplace else to learn another culture. And so a lot of that has been lost. And especially for me, my goal is, and I think with most of us, is, is that we want our children to learn that you are Native American. We are still here, and we want you to be proud of your heritage. What we've lost, we can, we can gain back. Mm -hmm. We've lost a lot of ground, um, but we can gain it back if we teach, if we teach, if we stand up and teach our young people that it's, it's not bad to be Native American, mm -hmm. that, that we are a part of your history, and that we want you to know our history. And so we need to teach our children. Is that something that can be done um, as he said, kind of in two worlds, of, of out and about uh, assimilated, or does it require, I don't want to call it a drawing back, or I, I don't want to, I'm, to me it's not an isolationist thing. Does it require, though, the drawing back and, and, and coming together, kind of how it is on a reservation where it's just very um, focused and very pure? Does it require that, or can it be done out and about and assimilated, so to speak? I had an elder tell me once that a Native American is not so much your blood quantum as what you feel in your spirit and in your heart. And I think that um, the, the walk that we are teaching our children is to walk with pride, walk with pride in their culture and in themselves and be proud of who they are. And if they walk with that pride and if they walk with that culture and they walk with that spirituality off the reservation, they can maintain that. It, it's, it's the quality of the person. You know, you carry that off the reservation with you and live your life. So I think that they can mingle together. It's just that we've, we've, we've struggled so much as a people coming together and striving for what is ours, and that's to be recognized as a people that we've forgotten, you know, that you have to stay strong, you have to teach, you have to stand up for yourself, you know, and you have to teach your children that it's okay to be proud. Very cool. I, I just had this image of this thought of bloom where you're planted and how wherever you are you, you plant that seed and then as parents you guys water them with with the knowledge and the truth of, of who they are and let them grow in that and then their surroundings made more beautiful by their presence and it would be less so without them I had a young child talk to me not too long ago and she told me she says well she says my mama said that you know, you Native American people don't exist anymore, that, we, that, that you guys are just, you know, pretending to be Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And I had an elder tell me once that a Native American is, is a seed. We are seed. Creator blessed us and gave us. And what happened to us as a people, we were divided and separated and conquered, and we were thrown all over the United States. But that seed has been planted, and it's still the same seed. Mm -hmm. um, we ha we're learning to, to grow someplace different, but still maintain who we are. So, I mean, that's, I guess I look at that now that way, just like what you said, we, we are that seed, we are that plant that is growing. We still, we may, may not be in our, you know, where we originally started, or where we, you know, we grew up, or where our culture began, but we can plant ourselves, and we can grow strong from where we are. Wow, and as you pointed out earlier, almost every group of people, this has been done to them in some sort of way, so it's a, uh, it's a unifier in a way to know that other people, you know, I, I think of uh, what uh, Jewish people went through in Holocaust and, and I'm sure and, and people, what some people are going through Africa now is, is they're in some ways being obliterated, in some ways they're having their identity taken and then the next step is, is in healing is to go back and remember who you are and try to, try to live that out again. Absolutely. Yes. Never forget where you came from. What does, what does the All Nations drum, how does that play into each of you doing that? How, is, is, is it a major vehicle? Is it one of the ways that you guys live that out? Whenever, I, whenever we go and we do events and we, we like our, uh, Tyler, a talk in the circle, that's our sacred place. That's where we get our spiritualism. That's where we get uh, 
the, the, the strength to, to carry and to go on and to teach the, the young. When we're in that circle and we're playing those songs and we're getting close to Creator at that time, you don't feel, you don't feel no pain. Um, you don't feel no bad. It's all good. It's just, it can't get no better than that. Everyone's singing and everyone's dancing. Everybody's is, is just, you know, having a good time and feeling pleasant. We forget about all those things that have come upon us through the day. And then when that song's over with and that powwow's over with, then we come back to reality. Now we got to be who we don't want to be when we leave this place because all of our family and all of our friends are heading off to other places. So that's why I say the second gear kicks in, second life. Then we got to go back to, to the houses that we, that we live and, and uh, you know, there's certain criteria there that we got to do. Even though we don't want to do them sometimes, we have to. But that's called fitting in. So there's where the two lives and, and, and the, the sacredness and, and, and who we are comes about. And that speaks back to what Tyler said earlier because I didn't fully understand what he meant when he said, you come and you feel good. When yes. you leave, you don't feel as good. And I thought, why is It's that? our church. Why is that? Why do you not feel Absolutely. as good when you leave? And it's because of the experience you had and, and the connection you're making. And Native right. Americans, they believe in one creator too. They don't believe in worshiping and idolizing different animals and things. We respect them. We respect what creator had made. What, you know, you can sit and you can watch how to do something just by watching an animal. Absolutely. Yeah. You may be lost and need to survive. They may show you how to get water. But the thing about it is, is we go through life. I bet you how many people notice the, the hawk that's yeah. sitting on that pole when you go to work, or maybe that eagle for that matter. Uh, maybe, how many of you seen, I've seen wolves, coyotes yeah. here in, in Milford, you know, that a lot of people don't really recognize and see. They just think it's an old stray dog. We, got, we, we as Native Americans, I think, we do open up our eyes more because we're closer to the earth and the things that pertain to that, that uh, we look for those things and we always respect them. And, you know, we, we, we are the, uh, the givers that try to keep these things in good existence and keep the, the, the place clean where we're at and the waters and things good for the animals. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, thank you for saying that. I, I love what you said because something that bothers me is, um, uh, if, if I may, on a soapbox, it's not my time, but it, what, something that bothers me is, is when, when anyone who speaks of uh, respecting what, you know, I know in, in the Bible talks about having dominion over or, um, you know, being caretakers. I think a lot of people have forgotten that, mm -hmm. Christian or not, um, they have a responsibility to where we are and what's around us Absolutely. and not just feeling ownership over it and not caring about that. And, right. and it doesn't mean that you're, that you're making an idol or a god out of something just because you respect it and want to take care of it right. and want to see it continue. Yeah. I got asked a question one time from um, a woman I consider my adopted mom. And she said, baby, what do you, who do you pray to? And I said, I pray to Creator, Father, Son, Mother Earth, all the animals, all, even the snakes and mice that we sometimes don't like. Uh, but they're here for a purpose. Mm. And uh, she says, oh, you're praying wrong. I said, no. Who you call God and I call Creator are the same person. Absolutely. Same person. One God. Mm. Absolutely. One Creator. And after that, you know, she, she understood that what I was doing was not wrong. Mm. We pray to the same person. I think I think the way some people mischaracterize, um, whether it's whether it's sometimes it, this is true, but sometimes it's exaggerating. It's a stereotypical representation of Native American beliefs and attitudes towards the world and towards nature. But they they think that um, they, they make the mistake of thinking, like I said, that everything is worship and everything is like if if that was the case, it would be more like it is in India, where Absolutely. where livestock can walk around and no one's <coughs> touching them. I mean, everyone understands their role in this world, and, and there are resources and there are things that are there for us, but it's, it's the attitude in your heart Absolutely. and how you approach that and how you treat it. And, and when you do that correctly, then everybody gives to everybody a little bit. Ever since the first person, the first Italian, the first uh, uh, African American, the first white man ever came here, we were singing and dancing <laughs> and giving honor and praise to Creator above from the beginning of time. And, uh, you know, they, I think I heard them say back then, the Catholics, when they come over and they said, 
we can't change these people. They have the perfect religion. They give thanks for everything. They are singing. They are dancing. So, you know, that was, that was in the beginning. We already knew who God was. Yeah. And the only thing that was, was wrong was we all needed to share it instead of just take it up. Mm. And when I go into schools and I talk to young children, one of the things that I tell them is that we all, in our hearts, Native American is, is a form of, of, not just as I said before, the quantum of your blood, but Native Americans believe that Creator blessed us with this earth. It is ours. And we are the caretakers for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so when we talk about giving thanks, if we were to kill a meal, we give thanks. We're thankful for everything, and, um, and we're mindful for what we do. If we take, we give back, because it is a gift, and we're here to take care of it. So I ask the children when I go into school, you know, be mindful of what you do. Everything that you have is a gift from Creator, so take care of it and be thankful for it and give back. Speaking of thanks, uh, this is the month of November. <laughs> what significance does the month of November hold for Native American people? Mm. Well, <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> I mean, a lot of the schools celebrate Thanksgiving, and they have the, you know, the traditional making of the, the turkey and the, um, um, you know, the Native Americans coming to share at the table. Um, it's kind of a joke around where I work at because um, they say, Tommy, are you going to celebrate Thanksgiving? And I said, hmm, let me think about that. Uh, no. <laughs> um, we have a Thanksgiving, um, so my, my people in particular, um, Celebration of the Seasons, we're thankful for, it's a time to step back and to look at the blessings that Creator has given us, the different seasons that He's given us. Um, I think that schools need to get it together and they need to start teaching the real Thanksgiving. Um, it's fairy tale book and it's not really what happened, um, but Sounds they like don't teach that. a good amount that. of some of the history that's taught. Yeah, truly. Yeah. And um, if, if they really want to call it history, then they really need to put it out there and they need to put what it really truly was. Um, it's a, you know, I don't want to go into it, but it, I mean, it's, uh, it, they need to read. <laughs> yeah, they really, they really need to read. They need to research. I mean, don't take, books are meant, written by men who write them from other men or women from other women. So a lot of times what they put in those books is what is good to hear, yes. not actually, actually what mm -hmm. needs to be out there. So I encourage my students, the students that I go and talk to, to do research on their own and to look. Um, Thanksgiving is a holiday that you celebrate, but in actuality, Thanksgiving, if you really look at it, wasn't um, a holiday that uh, the pilgrims celebrated either. Um, right. It was a holiday that a president created. So, right. yeah, so I mean... Right. You know, but they don't teach that in the schools. And interesting, you talk about um, certain decisions are made with curriculum and education. Mm -hmm. And right now, there uh, there's an there's an argument because I forget which state it was, but uh, they were attempting to uh, critique and rewrite some of the history because they thought some of it possibly um, encouraged um, what was it? Yeah. Uh, negative thought towards authority and questioning. <laughs> Uh, government, just kind of, kind of I, I, a term we might use as libertarian thinking or, or liberty or freedom thinking, they, they felt it, it, it would encourage that too much of kids thinking for themselves and possibly questioning what was going on around them. A great <laughs> scholar once wrote that if you change your history and write it to what makes you happy, the children and the people of the future can't learn. Absolutely. I mm -hmm. mean, you have nothing to base your not your learning from because it's not from truth. Hmm. And you repeat the same pro same same mistakes over. So um, it's really important to, in the schools that I go to, um, I talk to the teachers and I ask them, how, how much do you want me to say? I mean, I don't want to, you know, I mean, if I can get in political if you question. want, um, <laughs> but I would like to share some of the things that you don't share. The Dawes Act, um, um, they don't talk about that in the schools. Um, um, they don't talk about in the schools when the government stepped forward and took the children from their families because they wanted them to be good Christians. Mm -hmm. And I asked these teachers, how much do you want me to share? Because I've got a lot to share. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you have to be able to back it up. You have to be able to have your, let your, the students think for themselves and go out and research. Mm -hmm. Because these are things that aren't put in our history books, but these are our history. This is our history as a Native American people. And um, it's your history as well. Mm -hmm. And again, if you, don't, if you don't have it accurate, if you don't have it out there to be told, and you have it tucked back some way, then your path to the future is not going to be straight. I mean, you're going to repeat the same things over again and you're never going to learn. And um, that's not a good thing. I'm going to ask a question. It, it, if this is a struggle with 
with I, I she, some of it's negative. I mean, it is negative, but not that not that Native American people have a negative history. But some of the things that they've gone through could could sour. It, it, how do you avoid focusing on the the things that some people could let them turn them into victims, and instead embrace it and be like, "This is part of who I am," and and you step forward. You no, know, it's strength. been that it's it's been that way for a long time. It's been it, it's been when 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 they took the children, they they cut their hair, uh, they couldn't speak their language, they couldn't do the things that they were accustomed to. Everything that they had ever been known or been taught was thrown out the door, and they was throwing this strange stuff to them that they had to learn all over the language and even pick names. You know, go. In, I've seen how they picked in a book. You know, George, Paul, uh, John, this and that. So. Uh, you know, the, ma the fact of the matter is, is, is the children are still speaking their language. They still uh, portray their self how, they, how they've always have in the beginning. So I guess what we're trying to say is, is they haven't lost the things that, that the elders have told them and uh, taught them. So they're still here, but like, like you say, it's a, it's a struggle every day. To, to keep these traditions going on, these these things for these these children to be able to you know be able to talk their language and, and do their their own um, you know their, their live their own life how they lived it before so. express themselves as who exactly they really are. exactly yeah and when you talked about um, some of the negative things that happened to Native Americans. We're not asking for compensation for that, but we want it known. Mm -hmm. We want it known that so our journey from this point on can be built on honesty and truth. This is what happened to us. This is why we're standing before you. This is why we go before Congress and we speak to you and say, this is who we are. But you don't know who a person is until you know what, they've, what, what it is in the past, you know, and you draw your strength from it. You know, I think that's a fantastic point because Part of part of healing and part of moving forward, and, and I know that it can be done without this particular part. But part of it is is people recognizing it and and uh, owning it. And when you you know when you have a history of, of people where there have been massacres and, and and you've been relocated and you've been given things and then taken right back over and over, um, I, I'm sure it, I'm sure it is a it is a fantastic help when people recognize it for what it is and say and at least to say. I recognize what happened. I wasn't a part of that. I didn't even know what happened until now. But it's not going to happen again. Right. Absolutely. Really? Oh, man, we are out of time. <laughs> that was fast. Um, I'm not even sure we got to everything you guys wanted to get to, but thank oh. you so much for letting me just question you guys. and kind of. I didn't mean to take it on my own path. We would, also, we would also like to say anyone out there that would like to come to, like Appalachian Fest, the Patriot, different things around, look for the All Nations uh, drum and uh, come on out and, and Is there a way uh, to find information about you guys? Uh, we, uh, on, uh, I guess it's Facebook, yes. uh, under groups, uh, All Nations Drum. Okay. You can look under there. If you want more information about who they are, what they do, where they'll be, and, and possibly getting together with them, uh, go to on Facebook.com and All Nations Drum. I want to thank all of you for being, being on here today and thank for sharing, you. and I look forward to talking to you guys again. Awesome. Very much. All right, Thanks. we are all done. We'll see you next month. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the holiday seasons. See you next time.